Inside pack rough positioning is the second easiest to describe because while their positions aren't static, there's not a lot of variance. There are some subtleties that can make you a better inside pack ref, however, and I will try to touch on those here. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The date of this recording is July 2nd, 2014, and there have been no updates since the original presentation was released. At its most basic, of course, one inside pack ref goes in the front of the pack and one goes in the back. And between the two of you, you should have all of the engagement zone covered. As a rule, the back pack ref does most of the pack definition. And while the front can, and there are referees who prefer to perform pack definition from the front, there are situations where that front referee needs to be up to 60 feet away from the pack. So even if the front pack ref does the majority of pack definition, the back pack ref needs to be able to take over. The front pack ref is ideally placed to see multiplayer blocks because she or he can see arms linking or grabbing other body parts. The front pack ref is also in a great position to tell the jammer referees if the status of lead jammer has been taken or not since that IPR will have to be passed in order for that lead to be given, or not given as the case may be. The backpack ref, being generally closer to the pack, is in a better position to see direction of gameplay violations, blocks to the back, and low blocks within the pack. Let's focus a bit on the front inside pack ref, and also with jam starts. I'm going to talk about the jammer line and pivot line starts. And while the latter seems to have gone by the wayside, I still see it on occasion, so we should still be aware of this traditional method of lining up. In this type of start, you'll want to be on the pivot line looking for false starts. Remember that false starts include blockers in front of the pivot's hips, but only if one or both pivots are touching the pivot line and only on the pivot or pivots touching the pivot line. Anyone in front of the pivot line, or any non-pivots on the pivot line. Jammer line starts changed everything, however. Since there's a rush by the players to be as further back as possible to gain a tactical advantage, blockers will start in a tightly packed scrum. Tie-ups, both legal and illegal, are very easy to come by and also very difficult to spot. For myself, I like to line up closer than a lot of other inside pack refs, about 10 to 15 feet away from the pack. Outside pack refs, especially the furthest up front, can have a very similar angle from the outside, and I try to avoid duplicating what she's seeing. Also, since it takes me much less time to skate around the inside of the track than that outside pack ref, I'm much less likely to get overtaken by the skaters once the jam begins. Ultimately, however, pick what gives you the best view of that oncoming jam. I'd also recommend varying your position a bit. Try to see what's giving you the best view of all the skaters. Not just those in the front, but also those further back. Looking for where arms are crossed and where possible multiplayer blocks may take place. Don't be constrained by just going forwards or backwards either. I'll frequently lean in towards the track or angle further inside to get a different angle depending on how the players are lined up. See what gives you the best look, and remember that what works in one jam may not work later. Mix it up a bit. If you want to be a truly good or great front inside pack referee, I have a skill for you to work on, which is backward skating. If you watch games on WFTDA.TV, especially the playoffs and championships, 
you'll see that the front pack ref is skating backwards through most of the game. This allows the IPR to have a wider and longer field of view. You can skate forwards and crane your neck and body to do a passable job, but the reality is that you won't be able to see nearly as much as you can skating backwards, which means you will miss things. Don't not take an IPR roll if you can't skate backwards yet, but I highly recommend you add it to your list of skills you want to learn if you don't already have it down. Nowhere shows how good and how important backward skating can be than in a passive offense scenario, where one team is bridging the pack to extend the distance their teammates can block. In this case, the front pack ref's primary responsibility is to judge when blockers go out of play, followed by picking up any penalties dropped off by the jammer referee. If that pack is now 30 feet long, then out of play is 50 feet from where the majority of players in the pack are. Even if you prefer to perform pack definition from the front, this is a case where, unless absolutely necessary, pack definition is best handled by the back pack ref. Not to harp on it too much, and I promise this will be the last time I talk about it here, but the emergence and prevalence of these scenarios highlights the need for skating backwards. There's just no possible way for someone skating forward to be able to possibly see what's happening with both ends of the pack and deliver an accurate out-of-play call. Generally speaking, the best position for the front inside pack ref, and I'm talking any time here, not just during a passive offense situation, is to stay with the furthest in-play blocker. It can be very tempting, especially if the pack stretch is an extreme, to try to go between the pack and the jammer. I used to do it, and my idea was that I'd be better able to give and receive communication from the back pack ref who was defining the pack, especially in loud situations. But I was wrong. What happens is that you have to keep swiveling your head back and forth between the pack and the jammer engagement, and you end up missing things. And the easiest thing to miss is that blocker now engaging the jammer way out of play. Finally, let's wrap up the front inside pack ref with a bit on communicating to the jammer referees. The front IPR is the last chance for communication before the jam ref can award lead or not, or award points. Like all ref to ref communication during a jam, it should be short and concise. Usually the most important and most desired information to jammer referees is the status of lead jammer. There's no global standard for this. I've heard open and closed, or lead is open and lead is closed, available or taken, and there may be others. I've seen more leagues migrate to open and closed because they're shorter and easier to differentiate. Something I let jam refs know before a game is that I will try to get that information to them, but if all hell is breaking loose, they still need to pick it up on their own. The open and closed information is helpful, but not required. Calling penalties is a higher priority. Other information that can be helpful is if the other jammer goes to the penalty box, so the jammer ref can award the proper not on the track point and information if there was an initiation that the jammer ref may not have seen, especially if the jammer and jam ref are flying through at high speed. Now let's shift to the backpack ref. Positioning for backpack refs isn't static, but doesn't change wildly either. As a rule, the furthest they go, and this doesn't mean you have to, is between the two halves of a no pack, so they can judge when that pack is restored. Backpack refs may move forward or back depending on the positions of the jam refs so they get the best view of players who are actively engaging others in the engagement zone. Short pack refs, and I count myself amongst them, typically do a lot more dancing and moving up and down so as not to be blocked by taller jammer referees. At jam starts, I typically start further behind the jam refs, and if one ref runs ahead of the other, I'll sometimes go in between them so I can get a better view of the middle of the pack. 
there's not a great way to say when to do so. It's a matter of getting a feel for the game and making a decision on when you think it'll be the best time to shift. Sometimes, and again, speaking for myself, I have to shift a lot. Tall backpack revs have the option to just observe from their stilt-like legs, I guess. But if you are tall, I'd plan ahead just in case you get someone just as tall as you are tasked to watch a jammer. Backpack rests perform a crucial duty in passive offense situations as well, being pack definition. A trick, which I've been told began in Atlanta, is calling out the number of blockers in a pack to help the front pack ref know where the break is. Typically, it starts with pack is all, to pack is three, or just three, then two, one, and of course, no pack. Most of the time, the defensive blockers bridging out are trying to stay as close to 10 feet apart as possible to prolong the time their teammates can keep blocking the opposing jammer, which means when the front pack ref is 50 feet away from the majority of the pack, she may not be able to see where that break is, if there is one. This system lets the backpack ref relay that information to help make that out of play call as accurate as possible. The backpack ref can also relay lead jammer status, jammers in a penalty box, or really any of the other information that I talked about for the front pack ref. I'd like to close with another two scenarios I've seen pop up a bit in the last couple years and which has become more common. For lack of a better term, I'm calling it the reverse bridge. This is just like the passive offense scenario, except that the blockers are actively bridging into the back, usually to force an opposing blocker or jammer to travel as far back as possible before re-entering. If that happens, it's the backpack ref that needs to travel along to help judge cuts, illegal re-entries to the track, or out of play while the front inside pack ref moves to cover the pack and pack definition. Some Wiley players will try to force a cut if they can, so the distance really should be covered by, ideally, both by the back pack ref and an outside pack ref. And for this scenario, good luck. Seriously, at this point you know something is going to be short shifted. So you need to pick what's the most important item to give the best coverage to. If there's a jammer up front, then the inside pack ref should be up there. Points are at stake and those need to be given priority. And while we could say the same thing if there's a jammer in the back, like in this scenario, I'd be tempted to stay at the point where the two teams form a pack as you should have an outside pack ref and a jammer ref able to pick up any penalties at the back of that reversed bridge. Same if it wasn't a jammer in the back, but a blocker. Pack definition that's teetering on a no pack is a greater priority than a blocker re-entering the track from the outside where an outside pack ref should have it covered. I hope this introduction to inside pack refing has proved useful. Just like all the material here, this is not the end all be all of positioning and duties, but hopefully it gives you a foundation on where to start. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. I'd also like to thank the following photographers who have given me permission to use their photos. Corfan, Doff Lensgren, and Y.I. Otter. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.